We're going to get started in a minute. We're having the usual technical issues. Um, could we have um, volunteers for uh, looking at Jabber and taking notes for the day? John, would you could you do notes? Thank you very much, John. That's very nice of you. And somebody could monitor Jabber. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, you sort of channel at mic if if needed. Oh yeah, that. Oh, you mean the not? Uh, they they handle the slides, so it's a problem, not a problem. We just display the slides as long as we project the slides, and it's fine. All right, so we're just getting the slides up on the projector, and then we're going to get started. Mirror. Excellent. All we need now is to, is to bring up the materials. Oh, I, I think you. Yes, exactly. Scroll down and hit the main deck. And then full screen. Or, or we can just do that. We can just
we can use this player pattern. Do you want to talk about it? All right. So, um, welcome to UTA, um, in ITF Chicago. Um, if if you have very good eyesight, you can see the note well screen sort of displayed um, sort of tiny tiny fonts on the um, on the uh, on, on the projector. I think everybody has. Um, I, everybody has seen the note well before, but if you haven't, sort of look it up because you won't be able to read that. Uh, all right. This is our agenda for today. Um, we're going to do um, um, a few, actually, two, uh, at least one um, remote presentation here. We're going to do STS. Um, hopefully, start with STS, and then we're going to do um, deep, and uh, and then um, Jim Fenton's draft, and see where we are with that. Um, so, I, I, I let's see if we have the um, the STS folks. On Meet Echo, Daniel is right there. So let's see if you, Daniel, if you sort of virtually step up to the speaker list. Okay. Can you hear me? And you should be able to speak. Now you say something so we can hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Okay. So if um, we're just gonna queue up, queue up your slides. All right. Great. In, in the meanwhile, I would like to, to say a few words. So you saw the agenda for our, for our session today. We basically have three groups of slides. Uh, the first one is about uh, communication, email, email communications between the servers. The second group or one, uh, uh, one draft is about the communication between the MTA at the server, the first half, and the third draft, the third group, is, um, is about uh, the required header. It's all related to email, and, um, and actually, the, especially the first two topics are in a pretty advanced stage. Uh, we have been working on them for almost two years now, and we would really like to get all your input uh, at the end of each presentation and see how we can make it happen um, because we do want these uh, standards to remain relevant uh, and so and so our, your help and engagement is needed basically we would like after this uh, session after this week uh, to ask for the last call on the sts drafts and we will see what we do with the with the other ones as well hopefully uh, we will be able to accomplish this work um, in the near future. So with that, and with technical difficulties. We're having a resolution issue here. So we're, we're looking at the, uh, the screen in an in a embarrassingly small font. Um, <laughs> no, I actually don't know. Hang on. First slide of the. All right. I, I think um, we just let Daniel start talking now because we've got at least some version of your slides up. Um, uh, it, it's uh, not perfect, but it's uh, enough to go on. So, Daniel, take it away. Okay. We're at the first slide. Just right. tell us when you want us to flip slides. Will do. Thank you very much. Um, cool. So uh, audio quality, I hope, is OK. Um, I wanted to apologize that none of us were able to be there in person, but um, hopefully this works all right. So um, I'm going to give a brief overview of uh, both the TLS RPT and the STS um, drafts sort of as they stand. I think for a lot of people in the audience, this is probably uh, familiar. And so hopefully you'll kind of bear with me, but I wanted to just give sort of some background first. Um, so next slide, if you would, please. Are you on the next slide? Because I'm 
Uh, sure we're, we're about to. Okay, I was worried it was delayed here. There we are. Oh, perfect. Okay, so um, just again, really quickly for people who sort of you know don't remember or weren't in the previous sessions, we're trying to advance two related drafts. One we're calling TLS RPT, which is for transport layer security reporting. And the idea is just to provide sort of a very simple protocol for advertising, um, sort of in the DMARC style that you would like to receive reports about TLS negotiation errors, uh, Dane validation failures, and STS failures uh, for mail coming to your domain. And so we're sort of trying to get a little bit of transparency into how uh, server to server SMTP uh, is or isn't secured. The second draft, I think that the sort of larger one is MTA STS, which is for strict transport security for uh, server to server SMTP. And the idea here is to provide some guarantees about what kind of uh, server authentication and what kind of encryption you can expect between servers. Um, so next slide, if you would. Um, so sure. sort of a refresher for people, again, I think not everybody in the audience is super familiar with this stuff, but um, I think there, there are basically uh, multiple opportunities with the way that server to server SMTP works today for a uh, man in the middle attack. So the obvious one, if the recipient domain is not using DNSSEC or the sender is not validating it, is uh, MX injection. Have the sender speak to your host instead of the, the actual host. Um, uh, another option, of course, is to do a downgrade attack at some point along the way. Uh, BGP injection, um, simply uh, serving, you know, pretending to be the recipient host, but serving a cert that matches your host and not the not the actual recipient works fine because pretty much nobody absent Dane today does uh, certificate validation. You know, requires TLS in, in, in any manner, um, and and so uh, I think in the last sort of handful of years we've seen that opportunistic TLS in the form of Start TLS has really taken off and is really widely deployed, uh, which is great. I think it's really good for sort of preventing passive man in the middle attacks. Um, but, you know, I think there are sort of a handful of uh, attackers who are still sort of able to do active in the middle attacks against uh, specific targets. So uh, next slide, please. So um, quoting, well, this didn't really work out well, this slide, I think, but um, quoting from some research that uh, some colleagues of ours uh, submitted to the ACM two years ago, um, we had sort of uh, a survey of what appear to be TLS downgrade attacks in the wild by region um, as seen by incoming Gmail messages. And um, some of the data are missing from the slide, unfortunately, but I think people are probably widely familiar with this uh, survey. And, um, uh, you know, essentially like this does happen in the wild. I think we, we think that this is sort of something of a real threat. That's kind of the main motivator for this work. Um, I also wanna call out that uh, in, the, in the frame of TLS RPT, one of the main points is actually just to get this kind of insight on an ongoing basis. So instead of Gmail sort of being able to see this because we're a big provider and we have a lot of users, you know, we'd like to actually have a standard where people could sort of get this, you know, on, 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 a, on a sort of self-serve basis. Um, next slide, please. So all of that said, um, STS in a minute or less, I think you have a text record on your uh, on your recipient domain indicating that you participate in STS and indicating the latest uh, version of the policy that you're serving. You have an HTTPS endpoint actually serving the policy um, effectively. And there's sort of a handful of things I wanna call out about how this works effectively. Um, the policy says whether you expect to have uh, encryption and what senders should do if, if it's not present if they should actually continue to deliver but tell you about it with TLS RPT, or if they should actually not deliver messages. Um, it specifies what uh, the expected identity is of the uh, MX hosts. And there's sort of an open question on this point, so I'll come back to this in a couple slides. Um, but effectively, the authentication aspect, and uh, it specifies uh, an age. And the main point here is that because we're assuming that this will be deployed in places where DNSSEC and, and Dana are not available, um, we're relying on people discovering the existence of a policy for a recipient domain and caching it for a long time. And uh, the window of vulnerability on sort of injecting a false policy or pretending that the recipient doesn't have a policy if you're a man in the middle is thus small. And so long live caches, a CA based sort of web PKI based uh, validation. And basically a policy just says, I expect TLS and I expect you to verify these particular identities. Um, next slide, please. 
So TLSRPT in about five seconds, uh, it's basically like DMARC. You say, I'd like to receive reports about failures, send them here, and reports have some sort of predefined semantics for uh, failure categories. And I, I think are basically fairly verbose, fairly sort of free form, and we expect people to share uh, relevant information about TLS negotiation failures of, of, of all sorts. Um, you know, not being able to find a, a cipher you agree on, not having a certificate that validates according to Dane or, or STS, that kind of thing. So next slide. Um, so current status, I think there's been actually a lot of traffic quite recently, maybe no surprise on the UTA mailing list about this, um, but we're on version three of the drafts. Um, and I think uh, both, I mean, two, two points I want to point out is that we're sort of working at, at Google and a handful of other providers on pilot implementations. And we'd actually really like to sort of settle things enough that we can launch code without worrying about formats changing too much. Um, I think the other thing, as Arit said, is we're really trying to um, sort of, I don't, I don't mean curtail discussion, because I think a lot of the discussion we've had recently has been really valuable. But I, I do think we've sort of reached the point where the fundamental strokes are sort of seemingly mostly baked. So I think the architecture is kind of laid down. People seem to sort of mostly agree on how the system works. And we're kind of discussing a handful of detailed questions, which um, I'm going to talk about in a moment. So uh, I'm sort of hoping that in this forum, we can discuss these things out and, and sort of get some good feedback and move forward. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the, the first open question is, um, fairly uh, sort of aesthetic, I would say, um, but I, I think an important one, obviously people sometimes feel strongly about this, the policy as shown uh, in, in that screenshot earlier is JSON. We picked this basically because it's um, standards track and it's widely implemented. And I think everybody, especially sort of security-minded people, felt like asking people to write their own parsers is you know, uh, not totally desirable. On the other hand, uh, I, th I think the alternative proposal we're entertaining right now is basically key value pairs. Um, not a complicated parser, widely implemented by MTAs. Um, I think potentially some downsides, not tremendous ones, uh, potentially some upsides, again, not tremendous ones. So I, I, I see this as sort of not a really, really pressing argument, but um, I think we'd like to sort of basically get feedback and reach some consensus. Um, I think that the main points raised by uh, proponents of the, the key value pair approach is that um, a lot of MTAs deployed on sort of smaller footprint servers don't have a dependency on some JSON parser library today. Why should they have to take one? Which, uh, you know, is a fair point. So um, I think people can weigh in on this maybe once I go through one more slide. Um, the next one, please. Um, open question number two. And, and this one's a little more nitty gritty, but I think we've mostly resolved it, which is, um, uh, Victor Dukovny had, I think, a very good suggestion that um, the, the semantics of the sort of MX constraint that we have in the policy, as we originally designed it, it was a constraint on the host name, and the host name should match, you know, this list of valid MXs and should present a certificate which matches its own name. Um, and I think uh, Victor's suggestion, sort of in summary instead, is that the constraint be a constraint on the identity in the certificate presented by the MX. So the MX has to have a certificate which has a common name or a SAN which matches you know, one of the host names in this list, one of the name patterns in this list. And um, I think the main point of this actually is that uh, it doesn't modify the MX list traversal behavior. So you'll connect to every MX as advertised. And you'll simply drop them if they don't have a valid cert. And um, it actually also plays nicely with uh, Dane, which I, I think leaves the window open for people having certificates where the certificate name doesn't actually match the host name, it matches like the, the domain that the mailbox is at. And so we sort of want to make it easy for people to deploy this without uh, having to deploy new certificates. So I think there's a pretty compelling argument for making this change. And I've actually already made this change in the current sort of GitHub version of our draft. Uh, but again, I'd like to sort of get feedback from people on this, and I think the big counter argument to this approach actually is that we're suggesting people implement sort of custom certificate matching logic. And in particular, uh, the MX list could have a wild card, like as shown here, anything.example.com, and the certificate could have a wild card. And so there's kind of this possibility of wild card to wild card matching, which might be sort of mildly complicated. Um, so I think these are sort of the main open questions. Um, I have a few more slides on sort of status quo where we are in implementation, but I actually thought it might be better to just um, open the floor to 
sort of feedback on these so, two points. So then it's basically thank you, and uh, it's it's your choice whether you want to go through the, all the slides and then we open the mic and have the discussion about these two big open questions, or you would like to discuss them now? Well, I'm uh, in a bad position to read the audience, so I can sort of see some of these at the microphone. So I'm, I'm happy to take questions now. I think that the remaining slides, if people are curious, are sort of where we are in the implementation stage. Um, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it, but I, I think we gave those slides actually before, and we have sort of minor updates and that we're farther along on implementation. So maybe to the full stage. So you think these are the two main questions, issues that stand between, um, between getting the drafts to the last call? I'm optimistically, I, I hope so. I think we've had some other feedback on sort of style and, and clarity and things like this, but I think nothing really sort of major in terms of function. Okay. So we have Victor on the call, and we have, yeah, in person as well. Go, go ahead. Um, Alex Mayover, I admit I didn't read the draft yet. Um, I have one question. Um, is there any text in the draft about the TTL of the SDS definition? So when does it expire? Is that based on the TTL of the DNS record? Or yeah, so actually again, we, um, and, and I probably went through the slide a little too quickly, but if uh, you later get the chance to go back to the slide where I showed the example policy. Um, so we have obviously a DNS TTL, as you said, but the policy has embedded in it uh, its own max age, which is how long you can hash it for. And so this is sort of a compromise, obviously, because like, uh, I think, if I remember right, HSTS doesn't have an expiration, um, but we were sort of worried about the possibility that you sort of shoot yourself in the foot and can't receive mail, you know, ever. So um, now you can update a policy as long as you have a certificate for your domain, but seems safe to have a max age. Okay, cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. who, who else is on there? Oh, um, let's see, that, so let's see if I can, if this works, if I hit the button, I don't, maybe it kills uh, Daniel's speaking rights. We'll see what happens. Oh, yeah, no. There you go, Victor. Please. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Absolutely. OK. Yes, we can hear you, Victor. Go All right, thanks. So um, about the JSON issue, um, the main thing I wanted to make sure is that the folks who are addressing it really are focused on MTAs. Um, as opposed to some other hypothetical environment in which they might like to see JSON. Uh, because, you know, if it's just sexy because you write all your Python code in, you know, with JSON, but you're not planning to write a Python MTA, then, you know, really, you know, enjoy JSON elsewhere. Uh, so I hope that people come at this with a very practical viewpoint in that they're maintaining or planning to write an MTA and and for their you know, design, JSON does or doesn't make sense. That's that's it for a moment. Right. Th thank you, Victor. Um, is, uh, go ahead, we, we can ask some questions, but uh, let's uh, finish. Okay, uh, hi, this is Jim Fenton. Uh, so I have uh, a question about uh, TLS report and one about, and, um, and one about STS. The, the rep in the reporting draft, we have a, an existing example of um, a policy that calls for reporting in DMARC. And I was wondering if you had, and I, I apologize, I still haven't gone through and done a detailed review, but how, how this compares with DMARC, because one of the things that I notice isn't there that DMARC has is the ability for a uh, recipient of a report to advertise their willingness to re to accept reports from certain domains. So it, it basically uh, allows the re recipient of a report to um, not get spammed with with reports from people that just kind of say, well, gee, I'll just send my reports off to off to Dan and <laughs> or, or, or or whatever. So I was I was wondering if you had considered something like that or um, um, if uh, if you, you thought that that was not necessary. Um, right, so you can still hear me, right? So um, we did discuss this. I, I had to be honest that it's been uh, long enough ago that I can't remember my, my sort of detailed argument for why it wasn't necessary. Um, but I think we concluded basically that, so, so in DMARC, you know, obviously the, the, the case is that someone else 
sends me mail pretending to be from you and uh, pretending to be from them and their domain points reports to you and I sort of send a lot of spam to you. And you know the same dynamic doesn't exist here because the reports would be from somebody who's already sending me mail. So they could, I think, just spam me directly. And so I had sort of, I mean, this is sort of hand wavy. I had sort of a more solid argument for specifically why we thought this wasn't necessary um, when we discussed it. I'm happy to sort of dig it out of my email and share it with you. But I, I think we felt that because the, the person sending the reports is actually the person already sending the mail to begin with, there, there wasn't an opportunity to trick somebody else into sending a report for you unless they send you mail, right? Does that okay. make sense? Okay, as you can tell from my question, I haven't fully thought out the, yeah. the issue myself, but I, I just sort of wanted to raise well, it. Well, I think that, yeah, it's a fair, I think that leads me to the point actually. So to state it more clearly now that I have it back in my, sort of in my head, um, the point is basically if I, if I wanted to get you to send reports to somebody else to spam them, you would have to send me a bunch of mail anyway. And it seemed unlikely that you would, as a, as a good person, send me, the malicious person, a lot of mail, and I would sort of have TLS failures, and then you would sort of send them somewhere else, right? So um, it, it sort of didn't. And, and, and on, the, on the flip side, for sort of somebody else being able to receive my mail, uh, my reports, I'm sorry. For DMARC, it makes sense because people receiving DMARC reports may not themselves have a mail receive infrastructure. But here, the only people interested in receiving reports are those who are receiving mail anyway. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, my, my other question. Um, I have have some question about sort of for, for STS about the deployment dynamics of, uh, of the enforce mode. Um, I, I just have this feeling that, you know, there obviously there will be particular particular domains that are interested in enforcing, but by and large, you know, larger email providers and so forth will not be interested. You know, they 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 wouldn't want to turn it on because all of a sudden some of their users wouldn't be able to receive mail from certain of their other users, and they'd get a whole lot of complaint reports. So I guess my question is sort of from the standpoint of, say, Google. Would Google Mail be likely to deploy uh, uh, STS in force? Um, so I think, I mean, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, and I, I don't know if I could say for sure. Um, I would say that you know one of the lessons we've learned from, for example, P equals reject uh, with DMARC is that um, users are already confused about these things. And DMARC is, I think, actually much more confusing because the, the, the example case that I've seen is, you know, you have a, a Gmail account set up where your from header is set to your old Yahoo account and Yahoo switches on P equals reject. And who do you complain to that your mail isn't getting delivered? You don't complain to Yahoo, you complain to Gmail. Um, so I think actually DMARC created a, a world where um, users' expectations were, you know, for sound reasons, sort of heavily violated. And um, in comparison, uh, in, in Gmail, you know, we already have a UI that tells you if we think the, the message will be sent encrypted. Um, I think it's less of a change and, and I mean, to caveat this heavily, I'm not the product manager, like I can't speak for them, but I think it's significantly less of a change to say we're going to warn users that this message can't be guaranteed to be delivered with encryption. And, you know, perhaps to tell people mail shouldn't be sent at all if the other domain says that they want enforcement and vice versa. So kind of a hand wave your response because I can't say for sure, but I mean I I, I think that we. Yeah, I, I don't expect you to commit Google, but I just uh, if you I obviously I, I you know you probably thought about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, this is DKG. I'm just relaying from the Jabber room. Um, so we have a comment from Aaron Zauner, who uh, uh, who says he's still uncomfortable with having to rely on shipping trust related info with HTTPS. Um, we also have a comment from Victor Dukovny saying that he agrees that DMARC in particular is a very different context than this. Uh, and also that, um, this, that JSON adds a new dependency and MTAs are part of the base software footprint of multiple operating systems. All right. Um, so I would like to ask a couple of questions. Daniel, are you comfortable doing a couple of hums on these two core questions? Um, getting some feedback from the room. Uh, so sure. one of the things that I would like to offer is about, the, if we can step back to the previous slide. Um, 
starting with your open question number one about policy formats. So do, I want to make sure we have people in the room who are actually implementing this or planning to implement it. Otherwise, it just makes more sense mm -hmm. to do this on the list. So uh, hands up if you're sort of representing an organization who who are likely to implement um, this. Well, there, there, there are some. and. And I'm, I'm assuming there are some people on Jabber who are sort of virtually raising their hands too. Yeah, excellent. So uh, of, 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 of you people, um, would you prefer um, JSON or a key value uh, policy format? You can just express your, your indication or your, your preference by, um, well, raise your hand for, for JSON um, um, and then Raise your. It's okay to raise your hand for both, actually. Yeah, and, and raise your hand for for key value. Um, so we have uh, two on uh, Jabber for JSON and three on Jabber for JSON, and two on Jabber for key value. Yeah, it it actually is pretty pretty split down the middle here. So I think we're just going to have to go and ha keep sort of banging on this uh, issue on the mailing list. Um, yeah, I, you know, we. I think we all like to get a resolution on this, but you know, we clearly don't have consensus either way. Here. Um, is is there then, anybody um, who thinks it's really critical? Can I ask that? Like, I, I. Oh, I yeah, that's a fair question. Right? Yeah, that that's a fair question. Now, who who um, hands up? Who would wouldn't care either way? Who would be fine with either choice? And on Jabber, uh, several more votes for JSON on Jabber have come in. I'm not clear whether they were just uh, whether they're on lag. Uh, there's an uh, Aaron Zauner also says JSON parsing is a potential security concern. Uh, there's one vote that says just JSON, and one that says I would really like to avoid JSON. So there's two two so, people for who, for whom it sounds very serious, and a, a, several more votes saying preference for JSON, but not like absolute. All right. And, and, in the, and just to you, Daniel, in the room, uh, the majority, vast majority of people who voted before, also vo all of them voted for, they don't really care which one they will implement both. Okay. So I, if, if anything, we're, there's a slant towards JSON here, um, but it's not like by no means clear. Um, Marie Kucherovic, you back one slide. I would really like to avoid JSON. Um, so this, no, that was one now on forward. That, that one, no, that one. So if key value is widely implemented by MTAs, why does it potentially involve handwritten parsers? Those parsers are already written. We don't have to do new work, right? Yeah, I think uh, in the case where JSON, so, JSON is I mean, widely implemented, MTAs yeah. are using it, you have the, so I, I, I don't understand. It seems like you're trying to talk yourselves out of key equals value for a, for a reason I don't get. DKIM has been doing this for one since what, 07, 06? Mm. No, I don't know. We have we have some code written, but it's sort of 601, half a dozen of it for us. Yeah, I, I can't say I care. Um, I, I think obviously I'm in a poor position to weigh in because at Google, you know, it's not code that other people are using exactly. You know, we have our own MTA, and so it's sort of hard to speak to like Victor's concerns as post fix and Linux deployments. Keith Moore. Um, my comment about key value pairs is that, yes, MTAs implement a number of versions. There's a number of places in an MTA where you're going to look at key value pairs, and they're all different. So in practice, what you end up doing is writing a slightly different parser for every case that you need to look at key value pairs. The one advantage of JSON that I see, which is significant, is that at least if this becomes a trend, and the future extensions use JSON, you only need one parser. The downside of JSON, though, is that it now sort of admits a number of kind of silly cases that you wouldn't see before. For instance, a string value, you're expecting a string value, but now it's a list or something like that. So you have to take that into account when you're implementing. Mm -hmm. It's not a bad thing, but it is a different way of thinking. So I don't have a strong opinion either way, but I. I don't see, I mean, at least potentially in the future, there's a benefit for using JSON. All right, we clearly don't have consensus, but uh, you know, and we need to do this on the list and we are pressed for time quickly, mm -hmm. very quickly. Uh, I suggest that people who want to key value pairs that they 
write a proposal to the mailing list, how it's going to look like. So, I mean, I know it's not a huge difference, but so that we don't talk in abstract. Something that good. is specified versus something is not specified, then we have an, can good. compare apples to apples. Good, good point, generate a pull request or whatever. And I volunteer to do it. All right. After that uh, passive aggressive man bit of management, um, let's uh, go and uh, hit next and see. Uh, uh, go revisit the uh, visit the uh, no, no the host versus identity. Yeah. All right. So um, the same kind of feel from from the room and fr again from implementers. You know, ho ho you know, option one, option versus uh, option two. So host versus identity. You know. Can you raise your hand in preference for uh, for the first version here, the the host version? Um, and yeah, I did read the reporting draft. I didn't read the other one today. So why not both? I don't oh, that's know. A, that's I your just, question for Daniel. It's just in, in the sense of why not allow the policy to have an option for both, or in in the sense of why it doesn't do, why it's not an and. So is it is it specifying in the policy or is it the reporting bit? Sorry, I'm I, that's probably my computer. Exactly. Where am I going? In so so in the policy. So the question is, uh, you know, in the policy, should it always be that the MX constrains the host, or always be that the MX constrains only the the, the certificate? ID? Okay, I'm with you now. Now now we can pull. All right. So again, the the question is, if you prefer the the first option, match on host, uh, raise your hand or or say something on Jabber. Hmm? Yes, I'm I'm asking implementers, and nobody, and then. The no one in the room. Nobody, yeah. nobody in the room seems to prefer the the first option. That means that uh, if if you prefer the the second option, sort of pattern constraints for SAM and CM. And uh, does that same thing reflected in Jabber? Two hands up in Jabber. Two right. hands for the subject alt name. Yeah. Jabber. Okay. That means oh, there is. That, I I think that's. Pretty clear consensus for for, for uh, subject old name option, and we'll you know confirm on the list. But uh, but that's um, I think that's a that's consensus right there. All right. So um, do, so did you have more slides, Daniel? Um, I, I have a hint this, I, I, on where we're planning to go, but I, I actually think uh, the most important part was resolving those two questions. So. Right, because we're we're sort of a little yeah. bit pressed for time, so yeah. we might I think. No, we might I'm, I'm actually okay. skip those and go to. to I yeah. think that means you're up, Keith. I While we it. figure out how to switch lines. Thank you, Daniel. Thank, Thank you very much. So please bear two minutes with me. Probably less. Yeah. All right. Okay, here we go. Okay, so this is the uh, the sixth version of what was originally called the deep draft that uh, wait change slide. Um, that deals with interactions between the mail user agent and any of the servers that it talks to, at least any of those that use TCP. Uh, so this would be a POP or an IMAP server and uh, a submission server or an SMTP server used for submission. It could also apply to other things, uh, other protocols that would be used, say for directory lookup or things like that. Um, so go, go back. We're not, we're not go done. back. Um, okay, so that's the scope of the document. And um, there's basically two mechanisms that it implements. Uh, the first is that the user can specify a minimum confidenti confidentiality assurance level. Um, and the user is not going to see that term, but the idea is do, do you want confidentiality assurance or not, uh, at least as far as the current draft is concerned. There's only two settings that are defined. 
Um, and the default should be when you're configuring an email account that you do want that and that if you say you don't and your mail user agent will say, okay, if you insist, I will not enforce these minimum standards on your connection. But MUA should encourage uh, users to request that confidentiality. Uh, separately from this, there's a separate uh, second set of criteria, which is that user agents are, if the servers indicate that in the future they're going to support uh, certain security features, that if the mail user agent is capable of, of implementing those and requiring it, that the mail user agent upgrades its expectations. So the server can say, I will always support TLS 1.1. And from then on, the mail user agents will say, okay, TLS is always available, therefore I'm not going to downgrade because if I, if I, if something's trying to get me to accept a lower value of confidentiality, that's a man in the middle attack. So it's not going to downgrade anymore. Uh, both of those criteria have to be met. So you have to meet both the user's minimum expectation and the security attributes that you have uh, seen from the server before. Um, separately from this, uh, this document has made a decision to uh, prefer uh, TLS on a known port, which we're calling implicit TLS, instead of using star TLS. Uh, this is just based on experience with star TLS over the years, and this is, okay, we've tried it. Uh, we're, basically, it seems like moving to known ports is actually the better solution. Um, and then also has provisions for uh, some protocol fixes, some minor protocol fixes for some of these protocols, and in-band reporting of uh, these security directives and whether they were met. Okay, next slide. Um, the major changes in version six uh, are we changed the names of the, conf of the confidentiality assurance levels. Uh, so the, the previous version had no confidence or no confidentiality and high confidentiality. And that seems limiting because what happens when you need a value higher than high, uh, which I think we will need. Um, so I, I changed this to zero and one so that that you don't have to think about, well, what's the name of the next highest value or how, how high can you go or things like that. I think that what we've seen over and over again is that you have to keep raising the bar as the attacks get more sophisticated. So I don't think that P kicks with certificates that are trusted to the, to validate any name on earth uh, is going to be viable long term. So they were going to need other ways of uh, validating certificates and validating keys. Um, the second change and major change in 06 is, um, but in 05, the TLS cert could have a value of PKIX or could have a value of Dane. Uh, there was really no way to say how to specify that the server is going to commit to supporting both in the future. So of the various ways to kind of remedy that, this seems like the one that was least obtrusive, which is to define a new keyword, which is pkix plus Dane. Um, we can discuss, if people want to discuss what the alternatives were and why I thought they were worse, we could do that. But this seemed like the simplest change. Uh, and also, um, this can be used both in the uh, security assertions that the server's making, so it can say I'm using PKIX and Dane, I'm supporting both of these in the future. The client can also use this for reporting. I use both to validate, or I use one of one or the other to validate the cert. So it seems, seems flexible enough. Next slide. There are a lot of clarifications in 06. Um, the, the term confidentiality assurance level was kind of ambiguous, so I added yet another word to it to say that when the when the user sets this expectation, it's called the minimum a confidentiality assurance level. Um, when you're looking at a given session, that can have a confidentiality assurance level which is higher than the minimum. So that's why there's a distinction there. Um, make it clear that those two criteria, the minimum confidentiality assurance level and the security directives must both be satisfied in order to continue with the connection. Um, make it clear that clients may use protocols that if you have several uh, protocols associated with a mail account and some of them meet this minimum confidentiality assurance level and some don't, the client can still use the ones that do. So for instance, the client could read mail if that connection met that confidentiality assurance level 
but it might not be able to send mail at the moment because that's that connection is subject to an attack. It's kind of a minor point, but I wanted to make that clear. Um, TLS version 1.1 or greater is required to meet the um, minimum confidentiality assurance level of one. Um, and either PKIX or Dane suffices to meet that confidentiality assurance level. Uh, the previous draft was kind of ambiguous about that. Uh, and then also there's some clarifications about interaction with antivirus and anti spam mechanisms. Most of these I think are minor, but I'm trying to be complete. Next slide. Um, there's a question about I, I, something I need to look at is how TLS cert uh, a value of PKIX plus Dane might affect other protocols using this. I haven't looked at that yet. Uh, is there a need for confidentiality assurance levels greater than one in this document? I'm thinking not, but uh, that's future work. Uh, I believe it was previously agreed to separate out of the IANA portions. I, I didn't. I didn't get that memo before I was editing this document. Um, but, and I actually think it's a bad idea. Uh, it will slow down progress. But we could, we could go back there if we need to. Um, and then also, I'd like to add some language about exactly what it means if you get a connection that doesn't meet these criteria then let's specify in a little more detail what a client needs to do. I don't think that's controversial, but I think it needs to be done. Next slide. I think that's it. Yeah. Okay, that's all I have. Hi, uh, Jim Fenton again. <clears throat> uh, I, I see there being two different specifications here. One specification is the confidentiality assurance levels. It, it really doesn't define a protocol. It really defines a set of practices. And I guess I would see that as being some sort of a BCP sort of thing that uh, um, you know sort of defines how uh, MUAs ought to ought to behave and ought, and ought to be configured and how to how, how they ought to represent that to users. I think that's kind of a BCP sort of thing. The other piece of it, which is sort of the STS-like things, I see as being an entirely separate um, uh, sort, sort of capability. And for that, I, I, I honestly have a lot of trouble seeing the utility of what seems like a, a, a great deal of complexity there when the MUA MTA, or the, the MUA is always talking with the server uh, through a, um, uh, a direct connection and you know, either side, there's a protocol negotiation that goes on. Uh, and, you know, perhaps if you had the confidentiality assurance levels implemented, then that will be sufficient in order to make sure that the connection between the MUA and the MTA or submission agent or whatever is sufficiently secured. Okay. Um, first of all, I disagree on your first point. It is a protocol because this, uh, it, documents that implement this specification are required as a matter of protocol to abandon a connection that does not meet the user specifications. That is protocol. And it's appropriate for standards track. Um, the second point I think is that I get I also I would say that if you if you separated these into two specifications, then it's complicated because both of them affect the user interface and both of them affect the negotiation of the connection, things like that. So I think it's cleaner if these are both part of the same specification. Um, the latter point, though, I think overall, broader picture, we are trying to increase the level of privacy that email users experience. Now, we have, because of the complexity of email and that some of it, you know, it's hop to hop in this kind of thing, like we need a different solution in the MTA relay case than we need for the interactions between mail user agents and the servers they talk to. Those are different cases. One has an explicit relationship that's already defined, the other does not, so on and so forth. So that's, we started out, at least I started out with my first document, putting everything in the same document. That really was a mess because the relay case was so different. But we factored it, or I mean, I narrowed the scope of the document I was working on and then merged with Chris to release this document because the interactions between the MUA and the servers clearly was something that needed to be worked on. But this is part of a bigger picture, which is we really need for all of these things to be encrypted. And this is a legacy protocol or a legacy protocols that didn't 
that you know existed long before TLS existed, and we're trying to rectify that. So this is, you know, kind of a pat patchwork effort to raise the bar overall for email. So we got to Victor in the queue as well, and I want to you know, go ahead, Victor. Uh, uh, hi, I almost forgot my point during the uh, uh, the uh, previous uh, question. Um, uh, anyway, um, so I think the specification assumes that um, Dane is well defined for mail user agent to uh, SMTP or IMAP, um, but I'm not sure that that's the case. I mean, we have a general purpose Dane protocol in 6698, and then we have an MTA specific definition in 7672. Uh, that nails down some of the loose ends, you know, which certificate usages are applicable, which wildcard patterns are supported, and so on and so forth. And I haven't seen uh, any uh, real specification of Dane between M MUA and any of its various server flavors, nor do I know if there's really any appetite to do the work uh, in, you know, M mail user agents to add Dane support. Uh, so while I'd love to see that happen, I think there needs to be some interest in doing Dane for MUAs uh, before we wonder about whether to define PKX plus Dane for MUAs, because this Dane thing doesn't have any meaning yet, I think, for the MUA to IMAP or submission interaction. Am I on the right track there? I think you raise an interesting point, and it's something I want to look at. But uh, but I certainly agree that if if there's no if if it's not well defined how you verify a cert uh, of a a server that an MUA talks to using Dane, then we either have to find a simple way to define it, or we have to factor that out of this document. Because I don't want to I don't want to wait six months or a year to define all that stuff if it's not simple to do. Let me just uh, in, insert a question here. Have, have you, um, on a related note, have you, do you have um, discussions going on with implementers? Uh, I mean, major uh, MUA implementers who would actually um, implement this? I personally have not. Chris might have. Oh, okay. I think that'd be an interesting sort of, um, I think it'd be useful information to get at the list. I mean, the same, same kind of questions we asked. Um, for, for the MTA case, I think we at some point need to ask for the MUA case and just make sure that we're not sort of specifying stuff that nobody's implementing. Sure. Bron Gondwana, my question is from a user perspective, what does this setting actually mean? There's the my email doesn't work and my email works option. They will choose the my email works option without caring what's happening underneath for 99 point something percent of users. Uh, in which case, why bother having a switch at all? If it's going to work almost all the time, why not leave it turned on and not give them the option of switching it off? It seems to be a switch that either doesn't do anything or does the wrong thing. I think this is a question of, with if you only have opportunistic encryption, then you can't tell a user whether or not his connections are being attacked. There's no way to know that. Other than verifying that at least the certificate matches the name, in which case you're back to the same problem for web browsers. Uh, I don't know of any MUAs that I, only I, do opportunistic. I think all MUAs are checking certificates that I've seen or used. Sorry, I'm not meaning to, I'm not talking about certificate verification. I'm actually talking about, uh, like for instance, whether to use Start TLS or not, or whether to, to fail over from the TLS port okay. to Okay, so what we do at FastMail for this is exactly what you said, which is requiring that you use the implicit TLS port and we don't even listen on the start TLS port, in which case that problem is solved. But it's also an MUA that has is using this standard will also be an MUA that requires TLS by default and doesn't need anything else. It's just you must use TLS before I send the password over the wire and the problem's already solved. Well, except that I believe there are still a lot of servers out there that don't require TLS and that maybe don't even support it. So the user agents, as a practical matter, have to support these legacy servers. In which case, this does nothing. No, in, in which case, it tells the user what his expectations can be. Like, if I'm sending mail to your service, my MUA should always negotiate TLS. And if, if it ever fails to do that, something's wrong. Yes, but this doesn't need any additional standard. The MUA can just have a button that says yes or no, or require TLS before I make a connection. I, I think the, the real problem is 
that what you'd like is, let's say that, I, you know, because I've had this happen, uh, MUA that has been configured for years to talk to the same mail accounts, and the mail service provider has upgraded and now supports TLS consistently. And I shouldn't have to go back as a user. I have to know, and users in the wild have to know that they have to go change their configurations in order to raise the level of expectation. Uh, for uh, new accounts, it's a different question. How does having a different standard rather than the MUA is just putting code in that says, if I've seen a successful TLS connection, or uh, try a TLS connection each time, and if I see one, then require it from then on? There's a difference between a service provider you know, turning on TLS for some connections and they're, and they're making an explicit commitment to do that. So, I mean, Chris and I had this discussion earlier on when we were trying to do the graph and said, well, just because someone enables TLS does not mean they're going to commit to supporting it, that they're going to commit to putting valid certificates out there, so on and so forth. And so that's why we made that part explicit protocol. So the user says, I require the provider to supply TLS, which means they're reconfiguring their MUA for their legacy account anyway. Actually, no, that's, this is handled by the other mechanism, which is that the service provider asserts with these security directives that they're committing to these features in the, in the future, and the user agent automatically changes its configuration because that, the service provider has made that assertion. That's a different thing which from the minimum confidentiality assurance level, which is when the user configures the account, that basically the expectation is it's going to require uh, TLS and a valid certificate and, and all that, and only if the user insists will it set it to a lower value. So the default would be always require TLS, and then if, if it's like, oh, if you insist, okay, we'll. Okay, that that seems entirely a user agent configuration thing to me that doesn't need separate standard that's just interesting. Well, I mean, but. part of the purpose of the standard is to specify minimum requirements for implementations. So, and again, it is a matter of protocol because if something claims to meet the specification and then doesn't close the connection when those standards aren't met, it's failing to meet the protocol. So that's why it's appropriate for standards track is actually something that can be tested in implementations and so on and so forth. Well, there's already, sorry, Neil Jenkins. Um, there's already uh, the serve mechanism for looking up what the browser supports. We already have the, sorry, what, what uh, the configuration is for a particular mail service. There's already a um, separate port defined as we've seen we're going to use for implicit TLS. So again, if MUAs want to support this, they can just look that up. We can say just, you know, if you're a service, you should implement this. They look it up. If they see now that there's one with TLS there, they use TLS and don't offer to, to not use TLS. This doesn't seem to be giving a great win whilst giving a huge amount of extra complexity. And I just don't see it being hugely implemented. A huge amount of what? I didn't hear the last part. Extra complexity without the additional gain. Okay. I, I think that if this actually ends up being a huge amount of extra complexity that you know, we should look at it some more. It wasn't intended to be that, at least when we started drafting this document. Uh, that mail user agents that, for instance, already expect TLS and don't ever do anything else are, I think, trivially compiling, uh, complying. I'd have to go back and look again to make sure. Um, and, but again, the overall goal, and well, also I want to address your point about the service discovery mechanisms. My understanding is that they, they're not that widely used and also that they are subject to attack unless you use DNSSEC, to, unless they're signed by DNSSEC and use DNSSEC to verify them and all that. So the mechanisms we have here are using TLS to, to ensure that those things are not attacked, okay? So I think what we're trying to do here is, is make this overall upgrade email to always using TLS incrementally, right, without breaking existing things that people are doing, but get to the point where email, at least every hop of email is encrypted. And that's really the overall goal. And this, this seemed to be I the minimum set of things needed to get to that goal. I guess the main thing, I, I, there's a lot of providers, I and mean, a lot of the major providers only offer a, um, TLS connections, like I think Gmail does, Fastmail does. We haven't offered a um, non-TLS version for ages and just don't open the port. And that seems, for services that want to ensure this, 
the privacy and security. That seems somewhat simpler than something they can just do now. So it's what's the advantage over that, I guess, is my question. I think if if the providers that are only offering TLS and not offering any clear text connections and they're not having to support legacy mail user agents uh, or legacy connection configurations and that kind of thing, if if this is onerous for those people, I'd like to know about it. Ron Gondwana again. Legacy mail user agents are not going to upgrade to this. I'm legacy. talking about the, the uh, sorry, I said legacy mail user agents, but we're, really what I mean is the connections, the configurations of these mail user agents that haven't changed in years. Yeah. Because I think if you're running an email user agent that doesn't support TLS, I can't help you, right? You know, do you <laughs> but have, you're right. I'm not do trying to address that. how big the middle is between the things that will never upgrade and the things that are already there? that are worth trying to build yet another standard to bring that, that middle along? I think, I think what happens is a lot of people upgrade their mail user agents as they get updates, but don't upgrade their configurations. Um, and the idea is that make the, the configuration sort of automatically upgraded as the service providers increase their support for things. Um, so this is fairly easily solvable by the service providers by just it stops working, you fix it. It's oh, a that's a great time. support it's a, model. It, it's a one. Well, what's the alternative? This. this. I think this is a better better model to support than that. Yes. Uh, okay. I don't. I don't follow the upgrade path that that actually works, and that it can't be man in the middle to destroy the connection forever for that user. If they're connecting clear text without any encryption, then <laughs> a man in the middle could <laughs> take them down a separate path. Well, it only works if the user agent gets upgraded. That's true, right? If you're never upgrading your user agent. It will never comply with the spec. It will never implement or any other spec that we might write. So yes, at some point down the road, when you only have you know a tenth of percent of your subscribers still connecting in clear text, then turning them off and, and dealing with that tenth of a percent makes sense. Uh, I'm not sure it makes sense, you know, when half of your subscribers are doing that. So I was going to say um, we've done several upgrades like this to force users to higher security model connections, uh, which involves changing their settings over time. Yeah. Um, didn't require a new standard at all, and also is compatible with all MUAs because we actually have the login log, so we know who's connecting to us and we know what security they're connecting to us over. And so we would uh, start with say one percent, move up to two percent, and of of the ones using the insecure connections, email them and say you need to upgrade and after time cut them off at the server. So sure, they would still connect on that port, but we would reject the login, forcing them to upgrade. That way you can do partial users over time mm -hmm. until you've moved everyone, and then you shut the whole port off and the whole thing's gone. That lets you do this incremental upgrade to a higher security, lets you control how fast and who the customer support side of that, and doesn't require any new standards. We've done this several times. We have more to do because there's always new security stuff. Who's we? I'm sorry, sorry. fast mail. Okay. Um, All right. I'll, I mean, I'll go and take a look at that. I want to. I want to see if we really can affect all of this, because then maybe we should write a draft about that. If we can, if we can solve this problem without adding protocol. Maybe that's the right thing to do, and then we could publish a draft document about that. Um, so you please use the mic if you're gonna. If you're gonna have a conversation. So yeah, the great thing about that is, as, you know, it's a process, not a new standard. Is that you can do it without requiring any new support from the MUAs. Every MUA that supports TLS, you can do this with because it's just you managing this on the server. And um, yes, it's, it does mean the users themselves have to update the settings, but you control how many, how fast, and cut them off incrementally. And that incremental stuff's really important. I don't know if there was anything in this spec about that. It looked like it was everyone. Well, it would be hard to make it incremental. Um, there's always support issues with any kind of change like this, and so once you're at a sufficient size, you need to be able to do it in stages. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that as a process seems to get most of what this is trying to achieve without requiring new standards. Yeah, I'd want to go over the document, because I mean, this document is trying to achieve a number of different things, and I'd want to go over and say, what is it that we can't get by what you're proposing? Mm. The other thing I want to say is, like, how... Again, stepping back, the broader problem is how do we get all email encrypted? All email, and, and this is not end to end, that's a separate problem which is also still needs to be solved. But, um, 
and what's the best path to do it and how can this organization best promote that? So uh, if we can find a better approach than this document, I'm all for it. Or maybe, maybe a subset of this document is still needed, but yeah. Okay, that, that has been great, great conversation, very helpful. Um, actually, I would like to ask just out of curiosity, since this draft has been for a long time in works, um, how many vendors here actually have been playing, in, planning, implementing this draft in the room? Okay, I think in half. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. So. All right, All right. while we queue up, uh, Jim. Um, so uh, again, this is the ITF, and this is all about running code, right? So we're at some point we're going to get to the same sort of discussion we had for the last draft, and you know, look at implementers and make sure that what we're specking out actually has support among implementers. Um, uh, all right. Fine. No, the audio we're, we're has looking, dropped out. We're yeah, just we're, working on slides again for the remote people. Yep, yeah, we're looking for the slides. Yeah. We're ready to go. All right, take it away, Jim. Okay, let's. Uh, uh, so I'm here to talk about uh, a draft that we're calling Require TLS. Let's go on the next slide. And uh, so just to review, I, I presented it uh, initially at uh, Buenos Aires uh, last year and, uh, and then remotely once since. But uh, the, the, um, the issue here is that when you're sending an email message, you typically have no idea how it's going to be handled in transit, whether, whether the transit is going to be TLS protected or not. Sometimes when you're sending a message, like if I'm maybe talking with my financial advisor or maybe if I'm... Um, Often, uh, often some other country where I don't know uh, what their what their policies are there. Um, it's not entirely clear whether that message is going to be in the clear on the uh, uh, on the internet or not. Um, <clears throat> so, start TLS is uh, uh, I think everybody knows it's it's, it's opportunistic, um, and but uh, not only is the the question of whether to negotiate TLS opportunistic, but also Certificate verification is typically ignored. Um, that if if the the certificate of, of the uh, uh, SMTP server doesn't doesn't verify, we just kind of log that and keep going. This is often what you want, but it's not always what you want. Some senders want to prioritize uh, security over delivery, and um, that's what this is about. Next slide. So. The goal here is to allow the sender to specify um, uh, whether or not to, uh, to uh, require transport uh, encryption between MTAs in the, in the message path. Um, this is a different approach, complementary to the STS sorts of things where the recipient domain advertises a policy. <clears throat> It's very fine-grained. Uh, it's it's done in a message-by-message -message basis, so you know you don't have the uh, the potential for causing uh, large-scale breakage if you if you implement this. Um, uh, this provides some control over how certificates are to be verified, whether or not you insist that the that the uh, recipient uh, MTAs uh, uh, authenticate with with valid certificates or not. Um, and uh, and this is uh, uh, this is just between between MTAs. Although it occurred to me when I was writing the slides, that the, you know, if the the recipient got a message, the, the the last hop MTA got a message that was that was tagged require TLS. Maybe they might require that the message be retrieved securely or not. I haven't really given that much thought, but it seems like something that could be done. Next. <clears throat> So the approach here is you there's an additional service extension called require TLS that's in addition to start TLS. Um, the, uh, there are particular uh, uh, options for uh, certificate verification and also whether or not the MX lookup has to be done securely using uh, uh, DNSSEC. Um, 
uh, in, in that, that I won't read everything on the slides here, but uh, um, uh, the, that's what's there. There's also, and it was uh, recommended by uh, Victor, um, an option to not require TLS because there are times when, um, you know, especially in the presence of some of these policy mechanisms, there might be a time when you, there's a message that you just really want that message to get through. Maybe it's, uh, I don't know, some server going down or you know, something that's not sensitive but that you need to get through. And so there is, an, uh, in this uh, latest version of the draft, I added a, a require TLS equals no, which basically overrides a policy mechanism for uh, a particular message. <clears throat> Um, the, the, the requirements follow the message. If it goes through multi-hops, each, each hop uh, keeps track of the required TLS uh, status of that message and then uses that when it's sending the message onward. And there's no, there's no policy record here, so there isn't a discovery problem. Next slide. So um, I, I put out this new version of the draft mid-February with the, the things that I described um, particularly the required TLS equals no is the, is the biggest change there. Um, there are uh, now two uh, prototype Im implementations, one for XM and one for uh, MDEMON that have been done and we've done uh, some limited inter interoperability testing. We have some more to do there, but we have at least the ability to, uh, to exchange required TLS uh, uh, protected messages uh, with those. <clears throat> and then here's a little more detail on, on what's new. The require TLS equals no, which I already described. And uh, some additional guidance on what to do about bounces. Bounces are kind of a problem here because when you bounce a message, you want to require the same TLS going back toward the, uh, going back toward the uh, 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 return path, going back toward the sender of the message because you know, part of what we're trying to protect here is the uh, header information. And if the bounce message contains header information, it wants to be protected the same way. And so, um, you know, we need at least some, some guidance that says if you're going to send required TLS messages, make sure that you can receive them. Um, but uh, uh, there, there might be some other options as well. Go on. <clears throat> Um, so a few things that came up uh, on the list in terms of uh, issues. Uh, one was whether uh, require TLS should be advertised in the hello. Um, initially, when we didn't have require TLS equals no, the only time you could do require TLS was after you had negotiated start TLS, which meant that maybe we should only advertise it on the hello that occurs after start after TLS had been negotiated. So uh, that was that was one of the questions. Um, the, the 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 counter argument is that if you advertise it on all hellos, then at least you have some early indication of whether the recipient is likely to be able to accept the message or not. So you can abort before uh, actually negotiating TLS if you have a required TLS message. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, but this may be kind of a moot issue because require TLS equals no doesn't require the negotiation of TLS. So I guess we need to advertise it earlier. <clears throat> uh, the, uh, there's been some question about the, the different options. I, I use the names Dane and Chain. It's really Dane and PKIX probably are, are probably better names. Um, for much the same reasons as uh, uh, Keith was talking about with um, uh, uh, his draft, uh, the question was, are there, are there situations where uh, an attacker might have the ability to manufacture valid certificates? Uh, some of the attackers that we contemplate are perhaps uh, state level actors, and so that's a possibility, uh, although that's you know, maybe a very narrow corner case. Uh, so the question has been, is it, are we over engineering the spec by providing this level of granularity, this level of detail about how we require certificates to be uh, verified? Or should we just kind of say verify equals yet? So I, I believe Victor has a question to, 
Um, uh, I can wait a little bit. I just want to join the queue to respond to this point. Hello? Okay. Yeah, yeah, you, you I think I've got maybe one more slide. All right, so. do you, do you, can you hang on, Victor? And the, we'll, sure, or yes. Do you want to do your thing now? I want to hang on. Okay. Um, uh, kind of a similar question here about the uh, DNSSEC option. Uh, there's you know the usual skepticism about DNSSEC deployment and whether or not uh, having a requirement that the MX records look up with with DNSSEC is something that people will actually deploy. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the question about bounce messages or whether there's some way that we can send some sort of a redacted bounce message that doesn't reveal sensitive information but kind of will allow the originating um, MTA to uh, be able to figure out which message it was that didn't make it, maybe alert that user. Next. And so what I'm, what I'm wishing for from the working group is uh, more review. We've had kind of very thin, thin comments from uh, uh, a very few people. Uh, and I'd like to have enough that we could have something that we would call rough consensus. Um, I would like to see this adopted by the working group. Um, uh, you know, we've got interoperable implementation, so I think that represents a certain level of maturity of the specification. Uh, actually, we don't. We often adopt things that we don't have implementations of yet. Um, I'm looking for other people who like to try this out. You know, using using one of the implementations we've got or create one. And I'm looking for questions. And so, Victor, I guess you're up. Okay, thanks. So I guess I'm one of the uh, strongest uh, people behind the uh, it's over engineered viewpoint. Um, I'd like to very much suggest that anything more specific than uh, must TLS or must TLS with authentication uh, is is unlikely to to be deployable. Uh, so please, no specificity as to whether DNSSEC is used, whether Dane is used, whether PKX is used. I think no user is going to know even how to specify it or what it means. Uh, so. Uh, even whether or not a required TLS means with or without auth may not be something that users will really be able to understand, but at least I think those are the, the maximal levels that I would suggest are, are viable. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, as the instigator of required TLS equals no, um, I've been having some thoughts about how that should really work uh, on the side, and I'm wondering whether uh, that should be specified via ESMTP commands with required TLS, or maybe this uh, particular facility is better handled in, uh, as a header in the message rather than as a verb in the protocol. And the reason for that might be that required TLS equals no can safely travel through MTAs that don't understand the verb, right? If I have a legacy MTA that doesn't do TLS, doesn't know that it won't require TLS, it's okay because we can send the message on and then if then the following hop, hop somebody's very clever and might otherwise bounce the message because TLS policy by the receiving system is, is hostile to delivery here. Um, the, if we pass it through a header, then the header can tunnel to each and every node that might be able to uh, be a little bit more permissive in its policy. So unfortunately, I guess that's more uh, wear and tear on the draft, but maybe this is not the right channel for, uh, for TLS uh, optional. Maybe it should be a header instead. Um, the other thing is, um, should the, uh, is there still a, an SMTP working group anywhere at the IETF? Maybe we should involve them and not just Utah. I don't know how many folks who are uh, sort of uh, more focused on SMTP than the Alex is rush, rushing at to the mic. I, yeah, I'm, I can comment on this because there are private discussions about forming email maintenance working group. So, depending how they go, it might or might not happen. If it happens, it probably will happen very soon. All right. Um, yeah. 
Let me just respond very quickly to, yep. to Victor. Um, I guess with with respect to uh, putting it in a in a header, I understand the the motivation for that, and that's that's an interesting idea. I'm a little bit, it's from a sort of protocol layering standpoint, it seems seems to be a little bit a little bit tricky to handle uh, trying to to get that information out of the header in order to affect it. But uh, we've done things like that in the past. Um, the uh, I'm I'm more reluctant to remove the uh, the DNS sec option than I am to uh, merging the uh, uh, chain and Dane or chain and PKIX options, uh, just because it seems like there's a huge vulnerability, a huge verification vulnerability that exists if the MX gets spoofed, and uh, that that exists even if you have uh, verification of the uh, uh, of the certificate. Uh, just a quick comment on that, because I'm doing Dane adoption surveys. I have pretty good data on DNSSEC adoption. And um, at the moment, it looks like about two thirds to 1% of domains have published DNSSEC. Um, so we're a long way from anybody realistically uh, being able to require uh, DNSSEC on their uh, for transmission of any significant volume of mail. Um, uh, you know, the, the fraction of those who have DNSSEC actually, the Dudane is actually much more encouraging than the fraction of people who do DNSSEC in the first place. Um, so I think users specifying this will be very disappointed for a long time. All right. Um, I'm going to relay from Jabber. Uh, Aaron Zauner on Jabber points out that uh, uh, advertising this verb before start TLS gives an opportunity to strip the feature. OK, uh, Keith Moore, um, broad comments on this, uh, this document, or at least this facility. Uh, I believe it's useful uh, in, in sort of marginal cases, but it's still useful. It, I also believe it's orthogonal to MTSTS. Yes. In that those those two really have different use cases. Uh, as a user, I, I find it unlikely that anytime soon anyone would enable this for all outgoing messages. No, I, I, I don't think they would. So you, is this would be something that you would do on a per message or a per domain basis, perhaps. Like you know the path to this domain is something that, you know, should should be able to, you know, so you could do it that way, but it's not going to encourage um, sort of widespread adoption of MTA to MTA TLS. The, the idea is, you know, the, the, the use cases I have in mind are things like uh, reporters in the field when they're sending reports back to their newspapers could, you know, they would, they would know that, or, you know, they'd want to make sure that their reports were, were protected this way. Right. So they could do that because they know that the newspaper infrastructure supports it and they know hopefully their mail, I, their MSP supports it. So they can, for that particular case, they can make that and so they're not likely to have this bounce. Yeah. So yeah, okay. So it sounds like we're on the same page, that's good. So I like the idea, I'm not gonna dig into the details yet, but I like the idea, I just wanna point out it's a different problem, so yeah. Yeah, I, I don't expect, that, that's, a, that's the reason that it's message by message is I don't expect that it's gonna be something that people can turn on for everything. Bron Gondwana, I was in favor of the header until I just heard that. Um, the problem with having it as a header rather than something that's negotiated every single time between the MTAs is that if you negotiate it to the first hop with the header and it's sent correctly, and then it goes to a hop that doesn't understand this after that, it can quite easily go over a non-TLS connection and you'd have no way of knowing. Whereas if you have to, if every MTA that supports this has to explicitly check that the next one supports it as well as having a TLS connection, then you can follow the whole chain and know that it stayed TLS the whole way. Yeah, I think the case that Victor had in mind for using the header was the start TL, uh, the require TLS equals no, uh, which was the case where um, you know you you didn't need to ne to to negotiate it on every hop. All right, I'm going to cut the line after whoever is Victor and okay, that that line dissipated. Go ahead, Victor. Uh, just confirming what Keith said. Uh, yes. Oh, sorry, uh, Jim. Sorry, uh, uh, the just the no case is a candidate for a header. The yes case has to be a vote. All right. 
Um, so um, I want to get like uh, some guidance from our uh, AD here. Uh, it, would this be in scope for our charter? Or would you rather we, we sort of put this on somebody else? Um, in scope, yes. I would rather concentrate, uh, the working group concentrate on existing drafts first. That's a, that's I a mean, fair uh, point. Right? That's a fair point, right? And, and um, that doesn't mean that we need to delay this for, you know, nine nine months if we cannot mm -hmm. do anything else, but I, I would so like... What we could do, we could sort of ask, try to figure out whether there is interest in the in the working group for adopting, implementing something like this, right? Yeah. And that, that way, you know, Jim knows whether he should sort of keep sort of spinning on this or whether it's sort of worth his time to do so, right? And then we can decide to actually adopt uh, at a later time. Would that make sense? Yes. All right. Uh, and Jim was CC'd on a private conversation about email maintenance working group. So I think he's yep. fine to submit it there as well. I, yeah, don't, exactly. I don't mind. So um, assuming, you know, given the fact that we're, we're not going to like make a, make a call to adopt this uh, today, however, and given the fact that we seem to have a representation from quite a few implementers in, in the room and virtually over Jabber, you know, of the implementers, who would be in, who would implement this? Hand, hands in the air and Jabber plus ones or something. Um, who would consider implementing something like this, right? Doesn't have to be exactly like this, but something like this. Two hands raised on Jabber. Aaron Jonner, Victor Dukat, three. All right. Uh, and maybe fast, for, okay. With the emphasis, no. with an, emph there, with an there, emphasis on, one hand, on right. the simple, the simpler versions. Yeah, all right. right. Um, all right, so there, there seems to be at least some support for something like this in, in the implementation, and you already have two implementations. Um, um, in that case, I'm going to ask the, the other question, who, you know, um, and this is for the general working group, do you, would you support uh, adopting a, um, uh, uh, this, something that looks like this as a working group document? And you can and you can hum now. Mm. Well, there, there's there's something, right? All right, I'll t we'll take this as an indication that the, it it this isn't there. There is some interest here, and we'll definitely revisit this. Um, I, I guess you should take this as an indication to keep sort of keep spinning, Jim. Um, and with that, I think. We're, we're at three minutes uh, to the end of our meeting. If somebody has open issues to raise, um, now is the time, or you get three minutes back. All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Well, extremely useful. <laughs>